Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. And I welcome all you here this morning, and I welcome all those that are watching us online, and thank you for joining us this morning in our worship. Uh, we have a special guest speaker this morning, Pastor Mark Ongley from Beaver Falls. He used to preach 27 years in Ashes for Life uh, Church. Uh, it's an honor to have him with us. I told the early service uh, when Pastor Gary was talking to me about him coming, he said that Pastor Gary had, that was, Pastor Ongley had preached the best sermon he had ever heard in his life was preached by Pastor Mark. And he told him, you're welcome to come, but I don't want you preaching that sermon today because <laughs> they may never have me back. So we do welcome him, and it's, it is wonderful to have him with us this morning. Uh, I would tell you to take a few minutes, read through the announcements that are in the bulletin, and um, they may pertain to you this week. I know there's a men's dinner coming up, uh, I'd ask that you take a look at that, and if you would like to, come join us uh, on Thursday night, right, John, this Thursday. Um, the women always make a wonderful meal. It's delicious. Uh, Rich has a small announcement he'd like to make. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce uh, this year's 30 Pieces of Silver program. Uh, it's a great tradition that we have here, and it embodies the spirit of giving and selfless love during the Lenten season. This special program offers us the opportunity to contribute towards making a significant difference in the lives of others using the simple act of filling money sacks, uh, which are in the back here and out front. Um, you then fill those sacks with any spare change or any amount that you'd like, and then you'll bring those back in uh, either Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. Uh, this year, we're honored to uh, dedicate our collective efforts uh, to support Operation Underground Railroad. And if any of you have seen or heard of the movie The Sound of Freedom, uh, this is the organization that the movie was based on. Operation Underground Railroad is committed to protecting the most vulnerable among us, uh, which is our children. OUR works tirelessly across the globe to rescue and rehabilitate children who have fallen victim to exploitation it offers them hope, healing, and a chance for a brighter future. Their mission is to eradicate child exploitation and to provide safe environments where these young lives can recover, grow, and thrive free from the shadows of harm. Uh, an estimated 168 million children are engaged in the exploitation uh, industry worldwide. And unfortunately, it's a $150 billion industry and the problem is beyond staggering. So by participating in 30 Pieces of Silver program, you're joining hands with OUR in their noble cause, contributing to the restoration of innocence and childhoods stolen too soon. We really encourage you to join us in this vital cause. So let's come together in the act of kindness and generosity, embodying the love and compassion that define our faith. As we journey from now until Easter Sunday, May our collective efforts bring light and hope to those in need, reaffirming our commitment to making a difference in the world. We look forward to your participation in this year's 30 Pieces of Silver program, and we thank you in advance for your generous spirit and compassionate heart. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. If there are no other announcements, I would ask that you rise and join me together in the call to worship in the response of reading. We gather to remember and share stories of faith. Rejoice in goodness of the loving God. Wash it with the one who gives and sustains life. Sing praises to the one who is our refuge. Delight in God, whose protection we enjoy. Live with God, who frees us for new possibilities. We call out to God, expecting to be heard. We listen, knowing there is truth to be received. Amen. 
I ask that you remain standing and join me in singing hymn number 269, Our Lord Throughout These 40 Days, verses 1, 3, and 5. You may be seated. <clears throat> As we go to prayer this morning, I, I ask that you take the time to read all the names in the bulletin of those that are sick and not feeling well. Um, we continue to pray for those that have been harmed by fire and lost their home, and also for the, for the family that lost their mother in childbirth. And Lord, we pray for all those that are ailing, ah, excuse me, ailing here this morning. Uh, we will go to silent prayer right now, and then I will close us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we come before you this morning just asking that you join us here this morning. Join us here this morning to just worship and praise and honor you with everything we do and say this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning praying for those that are hurting, those that are ailing and sick and can't be with us here today. Lord, we have a special prayer for Pastor Gary and his family and that they may have travel mercies and they may return safely to us. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those that are hurting because of that. Lord, we pray for all those overseas. We pray for Israel. We pray for those that have lost loved ones in that war over there. Lord, we lift them all up to you today and we pray for peace. Peace in the Israel, peace in our country, peace all over the world because there is so much hurt 
and there is so much violence. Lord, we ask that you cure that violence. Chase that Satan violence away from us today. Lord, we ask that you protect all of us with your love and your mercy and your grace. And as we enter this time of Lenten season, Lord, we know that we come to you today knowing that you follow and you lead and guide us each and every day. You lift us up and you show us the way. Help us to read your word. And even though we fast and even though we sacrifice, Lord, we do that all for you this morning. And we do that all for you every day. Lord, I pray that you will guide and lead Pastor Mark as he gives us his word today. Let us enlighten. Let it enlighten us. Let it just lift us up. Lord, send your Holy Spirit down here this morning and show us all the way that we should go. And Lord, I ask that you help us all as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand as the ushers come forward, presenting his tithes and our offerings. Will you bow your head in prayer, please? From the abundance entrusted to us, we offer up the best we can give. Guide our use of this precious trust 
that it may be spent in ways you choose, in places where you would send us, for the sake of people among who you wish to dwell. May we bear witness to your abiding love, not only with money, but with dedicated lives. Allow us to be instruments of assurance and compassion in our homes where our journeys are led. Amen. You may be seated. Came from my guitar player. She was in the choir, so she's just derobing. <laughs> here she comes, here she comes. Thank you for waiting.
with anywhere without that. That beautiful, beautiful song that was just sung reminds me of a verse from 2 Corinthians, and I like to just pray with that verse. God, your word says it is he who died for us, that we are no longer to live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf on this Sunday morning. Oh, Lord God, get our attention. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are in a new season. I think many of you know that, a new season. Last Sunday was the Super Bowl, and on Thursday, the spring training for the Pirates begins. We are on the crest of a new season. <laughs> it's the season of Lent. This is the first Sunday of Lent. Last Sunday was Ash Wednesday, and it used to be before football was ever invented. Uh, people paid more attention to the seasons of the Christian year. And that's coming back. More and more churches, regardless of their tradition, they are learning to uh, recognize the seasons of the Christian year. When I was a child growing up in the 60s and 70s, uh, the small church that I grew up in did not really, I, I just don't remember the seasons of the year being prominent. We lit candles at Advent, which were, for me just seemed like a countdown to Christmas. And then during Lent, uh, our little town was largely Catholic. I guess it was probably a town the size of New Brighton, largely Catholic. And uh, I just knew people were, my friends were giving things up for Lent. And I thought, oh, okay. And I noticed that the cafeteria menu changed in school. Fish on Fridays every week. I just thought, what, why? Oh, it has something to do with Jesus? Well, that's okay. A friend of mine gave up flour for Lent, then realized that his favorite candy, licorice, is made of flour. And he was, oh, what did I do? Giving something up for Lent. During the Advent season, we sometimes wring our hands and say, oh my, they're taking Christ out of Christmas. Oh no, I went to Walmart and the, the cashier said, happy holidays. And I made sure I said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Jesus is the reason for the season. You know what? Jesus is the reason for every season. He's the reason for this season of Lent. Putting Christ back into Christmas. Let's put Christ back where he belongs, first in our hearts. That's what Lent helps us to do. In this passage, which um, I chose to read as part of my sermon, sorry to throw you off, uh, this passage is about fasting. And uh, as usual, the Pharisees were being critical of Jesus. The context is that he had just had a, a banquet with tax collectors. He had called Levi, also known as Matthew, had called him to be one of the disciples. And Levi, through a party, invited his friends, and tax collectors didn't have friends. Nobody liked the tax collectors, so he invited the other tax collectors. And the Pharisees said, who is this prophet that he eats with sinners, even tax collectors? 
And so here's the conversation that follows. Luke chapter five, beginning in verse 33. Then they said to him, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, they frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding attendants fast while the bridegroom is still with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will the one tear the new garment, not only will one tear the new garment, but the piece from the new will not match the old garment. Similarly, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will spill out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires the new wine, but says, ah, the old wine is better. Jesus uses this imagery of a wedding feast. Now, I, I don't know a lot about the weddings of that day, but what I have, have read is this, that the wedding feast um, wasn't like, how many of you, here I am from the 70s, my wedding, the reception, we had mints and cake and coffee and punch, and that was it. Now we have catering and feasts, and unless there's, it's one of those location weddings where someone says, I'm getting married in Hawaii. You wanna be in the wedding? Come on to Hawaii. Uh, weddings have changed so much, but in those days, the wedding feast didn't just take place one day and they go off on a cruise. No, they stayed in town. And for one week, the bride and groom were treated like royalty. They even called them the king and the queen. And so Jesus, using this metaphor, using this image, is pointing to a greater spiritual reality throughout the scriptures from the very beginning. Husband and wife coming together was a foreshadowing of one day when God's people, the church, would be joined together with the groom, Jesus himself. At the wedding supper of the Lamb, that day was coming and Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, they're getting a foretaste of what's going to come. The bridegroom's with them. We're having the feast. There's no reason to fast. Now, one day I will be taken, and then in that day they will fast. Now, that gives us a bit of a glimpse, an idea that fasting is related to the one that our soul loves. They didn't need to fast because Jesus was with them, but now that he's gone, the fasting reminds us of that absence. And the fasting reminds us that a day is coming when we will be joined together with the one that our hearts love. But our hearts grow dim. We become so very distraught. So very distracted. As Larry mentioned, I retired in June as a United Methodist pastor. I pastored, um, I was a pastor for 35 years. I, it, only 27 of those years were part of the 
United Methodist Church, and I served in Denver Falls my last four years at a church called Ashes to Life. And um, so this is my first year not being a pastor. Um, my family, we've, we've had a difficult fall and Christmas season. In September, my wife's father in Indianapolis, he passed away, wonderful man of God, 95 years old, still driving, still, uh, and at age 93, I gave him a ride back home to Indianapolis and he argued theology with me at 93. Sharp mind, man of God, and my wife, who is the executor of the estate, she said, is there anything you would want? And I said, well, he had a study Bible. I would love to have that if no one else wants it. Hardback study Bible. Uh, the spine was covered with duct tape. He loved Jesus. But he passed. My wife's the executor. It has added an enormous amount of stress to her life, and she's in poor health. She has chronic fatigue syndrome, and so this has really worn on her. We went out to Indianapolis around Thanksgiving to try to make more progress on settling the estate. Uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I had a sore throat. Thursday morning, I tested positive for COVID. And so um, we separated, we were staying in a hotel room. And so she had her own hotel room and I sat in a hotel room with COVID isolating for 10 days. She caught COVID four days later. And so she was in her hotel room. So that was Thanksgiving. And um, Christmas, we were both feeling a little better, but our daughter had COVID. And uh, we were just still weak from COVID and lacking in motivation and snowed under with other details. We didn't even decorate. Now we rarely decorate outside. We didn't even decorate inside. And on Christmas Eve Sunday, I thought there's no way I'm staying home on Christmas Eve. And uh, I've been attending a church out in Aliquippa. I went out there um, for the Christmas Eve service. They had two services, and the second service that I went to was not very well attended, large sanctuary, not many people, and I sat in the back off to the side where those ladies sit, kind of in the back, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Then I thought, here it is, Christmas Eve. First Christmas Eve service in 35 years that I was not leading or a part of. And I'm sitting and I thought, I'm gonna find someone to sit with. And I looked around, the only people that I had really been introduced to before was a young couple. So I, I went up and to my chagrin, they were in the very front row. To illustrate this, would you ladies just come up here and sit in the, no, sorry, no, sorry. So I'm sitting in the front row with this young couple that barely knows me, and the music starts, and we sing some of those wonderful Christmas carols, and then the, the pianist intermingled some more uh, contemporary music about the Christmas story, but also about the throne room and the Lamb of God uh, slain before the foundation of the world coming out into the, th and I just felt the presence of God unlike I had felt in a long time. And I began to cry. 
and, and they just did song after song. I don't know, maybe six or seven. Eventually, I just sat down, and I cried harder. And then I felt like God was saying to kneel. Yes, front row, in front of everyone. But I knelt, and then I just sobbed. I don't know what was going on inside of me, uh, but I do know I felt God's presence was so very real in that moment. At the end of the service, lights go back on, people are wondering, what do I do with the candles? And this young couple says to me, uh, the husband says, um, no offense, but and anytime someone begins a sentence that way, you just kind of brace yourself, right? <laughs> no offense, but... And then he said this, but I don't see too many people of your generation that has a hunger for God, like what you, you showed tonight. I don't see many people of your generation who have a hunger for God, and for a moment, I felt like I had to be the, the one to apologize for us baby boomers. Now, I'm, I'm a young baby boomer, but I was just like, well, you know, back in the late 60s and 70s, there was the Jesus movement, and we saw a great move of God, and on and on and on. And I wanted to say, at least our generation brought the best rock and roll of any generation. applause <laughs> of any generation especially the 70s 60s were good but the hunger a hunger for God and I reflected on that because the Jesus movement was a time when people had a hunger for God a hunger I think that the appetite was whetted by just some deep, deep emptiness born out of a, a decade of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And suddenly, people caught on fire for Jesus. And so we were Jesus freaks. Now, I was kind of on the tail end of that, being a, a graduate of 1975 from high school. But I do remember, I do remember, I grew up in a very small, um, well, maybe an average-sized local church was Evangelical United Brethren. I think some of you recognize that name. And it was a denomination where, as, growing up as a kid, I felt a, in, an intense love for God in that congregation, the church camp I went to. But our love can grow cold, can't it? In this passage, Jesus illustrates what he's saying about fasting by uh, referring to the, the garments and the wine. And I think we're more familiar with the, the new wine and old wine skins, that part of the story. But when you think about the garment, uh, he, he's saying you buy a new suit jacket and you, you've got this old one that you're so familiar with, it's very comfortable, and yet it's got this big, big tear in the seam in the back. So take, take your new suit coat and cut out a piece and sew it on that tear. He says, that's not something we do because you're going to ruin the new coat. And when the and when, if you, if you wash the, the old one, the patch will shrink and tear the old. You just can't do that. And what he is saying is, what he's saying is, these disciples of mine, who, yes, they are not fasting every week or twice a week like you Pharisees, but they are tasting something new. They're, they're getting a taste of what's going to happen in the heavens at the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
They're getting a taste of that. And it's a, it's a kingdom that's breaking forth and it cannot fit into the wineskins of the way you have been doing church, the way you've been doing religion. The laws of Moses called for fasting only one day out of the whole year. And the Pharisees, patting themselves on the back, were fasting once or twice a week. And Jesus said, this new kingdom is just not going to work on that old garment. And so Lent, during Lent, we give something up. That's the, that's the Christian tradition, and the purpose is not to make ourselves miserable. The purpose is to get ourselves to refocus, refocus on the one that our souls love, to capture, even if it's just a little bit, to capture the way that our hearts once so loved Jesus. Do you remember that when you first found Christ? Yes, during Lent, we're recognizing our sin and our need for, to repent. But it's not just doing away with some things, it's turning our hearts back to the one who loves us, the one we're engaged to. Giving up food, that's one way to fast, but there are other things we can give up, things that distract us. A part of a group that I was fellowshipping with, they decided they were gonna do a three-week fast in January, and I prayed about that and um, decided what God wanted me to fast from was not food, but from Brace yourselves. My cell phone. Yeah. How many of you have a cell phone? Does, yeah. Do, we, do you really need to take your cell phone to the bathroom? Do you? I've got to go to the bathroom. Where's my phone? What, what, and obviously I did not throw my phone away for Lent, but what I, what I felt God wanted me to do was to gain some control over it. I described my problem to a young person and he said, oh, that's doom scrolling, doom scrolling. I'd never heard of that. I said, what do you mean? He says, you're scrolling on your phone looking for headlines of articles you may want to read. I said, yeah, that's it. What's Fox say? Oh, 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 well, let me read that. What's CNN say? Oh, oh, uh-oh, let me read that. NFL.com. Oh, Taylor Swift and on NFL.com, what? What about MLB.com? Is there any news about the Pirates? Are the Pirates even going to be in the news this year? They've got a new pitcher. And so when you fast, it's not just doing away with something, doing without something, whether it's food or a cell phone or something else. It's saying yes to something else. And I felt God said, instead of doom scrolling, looking at headline after headline after headline, to meditate on scripture. And so I've been doing that memorizing verses of scripture, meditating on them, and 
it has wet my appetite. It has drawn my heart closer to God. It has. Absolutely it has. Now, is that hard to give up doom scrolling? Is it hard to give up using your phones for something like that? Uh, I see one person shaking their head no. Um, it's, it's become an addiction. And let, let me also say, I quit doom scrolling as we entered into the presidential primaries. <sighs> yeah. Anybody addicted to news when the primaries begin? I gave up doom scrolling as the NFL playoffs started. Which was actually kind of refreshing. I didn't know for like three days who it was that was actually going to play in the Super Bowl. Bizarre. I didn't know for a day and a half who actually won the Super Bowl. That's how out of the loop I was. But I was meditating on scripture, recapturing some love for the one who died for me. And that's priceless. When we were singing that first hymn, it reminded me, yes, in Lent, we remember the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the wilderness and was tempted. And he threw scripture back at Satan each time he tempted him. Uh, those passages all came from Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. And it is thought that while he's in the wilderness, he is meditating on God's word. So when the temptations come, boom. Boom, boom, he throws it right at the evil one. How many of you have seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution? Did any of you see it? No one saw the movie, The Jesus. Oh, surely you did. Was it good? Yeah, I didn't see it either. Uh, <laughs> You're laughing at me. Um, but, but it was a friend of mine that I meet with online every week. He's a pastor in Alabama, and he's even older than I am, but he was a part of the Jesus movement of the late 60s and 70s. He went to that movie, which is about the Jesus movement. He went to that movie, and he said that when the movie was over, he just was in the theater weeping. Someone from my generation who remembered that hunger for God. I challenge you all that during this season of Lent to ask God to remind you to, to whet your appetite for his word, to reignite the hunger and love for God that you once had. Because why? Because Jesus is the reason for this season. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, you are the one who died and rose again on our behalf. May we no longer live for ourselves, but for you, the one who loves us, and the one who deep down inside our souls love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are able, I ask you to stand, and let's close with our closing hymn. <laughs>
Thank you. 